From China to Europe, COVID-19 cases are on the rise. But what kind of threat does the BA2 variant pose? Hello, I'm Arun Naidu and this is The Heat. China is working to slow down widespread Omicron outbreaks with lockdowns and mass testing. The mainland reported nearly 4,800 new COVID-19 cases on Tuesday, mainly in the northeastern province of Jilin. Hong Kong is also battling the new variant with more than 14,000 new cases and 245 deaths, but will ease social distancing and resume international flights in April. COVID-19 cases are also on the rise across Europe. Many cities recently lifted mask mandates and other social distancing requirements. We'll hear from a British scientist about the situation in the United Kingdom later in the show. But first, let's bring in our panel. Joining us now from Providence, Rhode Island, is Dr. Megan Ranney. She's the academic dean at the School of Public Health at Brown University. Also with us from San Francisco, Dr. Monica Gandhi is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. And from the Republic of Korea, Dr. Jerome Kim is the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. Uh, and Dr. Kim, let me start with you. China has reported almost 4,800 new cases, mainly in the northeastern part of the country. This is the worst outbreak since the Wuhan outbreak uh, a little over two years ago. There are some cities in China which are under lockdown, and two deaths were reported over the weekend. What can you tell us about the situation there? So I think to put it in perspective, remember that China's population is over a billion, so 4,000 plus cases out of a billion people is not all that many. I think what is problematic uh, may be the dynamic zero uh, COVID policy. And, you know, Omicron has proven to be difficult for countries to deal with, even countries that had relatively good control with the other variants, such as South Korea. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, the government of South Korea made a decision, which I think was uh, appropriate that they couldn't keep up with tracking and tracing and isolating. So they put into place a, a, a mechanism for home care, for uh, self-diagnosis, for um, treatment of those people who break through. But South Korea has the advantage, had an advantage that China does not have. Among the elderly, not over 95% of people were, were vaccinated fully and, and a good proportion of them were boosted. Uh, in China, only 50% of the elderly have been fully vaccinated and an even smaller proportion boosted. So as one gets ready uh, to do and deal with COVID, the level of vaccination, I think, or natural infection is going to need to be higher. So Dr. Kim, under the circumstances you've just outlined there, would you say that China's policy, the zero COVID policy, would not be the best way to uh, deal with this? So in the long run, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult to isolate a country as, as large and as important to the global economy as China. And I think that the Chinese government is trying to, as the Korean government did, prepare for the time when uh, restrictions will need to be eased and people will be, would need to be let in. And I think Hong Kong is dealing with that on a very active basis. You know, they really had difficulty vaccinating the elderly and we've seen the consequence in Hong Kong. So I think the Chinese government has seen that and they, I, believe, understand that this series of lockdowns where they put 30 million people in the country under lockdown is something that, that will ultimately prove disruptive and uh, will at some point need to be changed. And, and at that point, they need to do much more vaccination, maybe with slightly different vaccines than were used originally. Dr. Monica Gandhi, what are your thoughts on China's policy, the zero COVID strategy to deal with COVID? We have seen lockdowns across the country. We have seen travel restrictions across the country as well. You know, I think that there is a misunderstanding about COVID that um, human behavior could change a lot of this. And what Dr. Kim really indicated is that it is something about the virus. It's four properties about the virus that make it impossible to be eradicated. One is that it's found in 29 species of animals. The second is that it's highly transmissible with a long infectious period. The third is that it looks like other respiratory pathogens. And the fourth is that increasingly our vaccines are not sterilizing because our antibodies will go down with time in our nasal cavities. 
and we have new variants. All of those put together means that there was a real attempt by China to do COVID zero. What we have seen now recently with BA1 and now BA2 is the most important predictor of how a country is doing is really vaccination and importantly vaccinating older people with appropriate vaccines. Uh, there was an implication from Dr. Kim's comments that Sinovac and Sinopharm are a whole inactivated variants that don't have the best adjuvant, so they're not as um, powerful. And we really need at least three vaccines for every individual for the WHO with those particular vaccines if they're going to continue to be used. So vaccinating older people first and boosting, giving three vaccines is tremendously important to avoid the what goes on with Omicron. And other countries you can see have higher vaccination rates in Europe now the U.S. more, and also higher natural immunity. And putting those two, two together with BA1 and BA2, even now, we're seeing hospitalization stay low across Europe. Uh, Dr. Megan Rani, uh, let's talk about Hong Kong. Hong Kong is lifting tr uh, flight bans, which it put in place for nine countries, including the United States. And it's also reducing the mandatory quarantine time for returning residents to seven days. And uh, Hong Kong authorities have said that only fully vaccinated residents are allowed to enter the city. What do you think these changes will achieve? So I think these changes start to reopen Hong Kong to the world. I think it recognizes that we are moving into a different phase of COVID-19. It also reflects the changing transmission dynamics of Omicron compared to earlier variants of COVID. Keeping people quarantined for 14 days doesn't make sense at this point. Honestly, even seven days for someone who's fully vaccinated, you can have them watch symptoms and you can have them tested three days and five days out. I think it recognizes just as the rest of the world has that it's time for us to move forward to figure out a strategy to protect our most vulnerable citizens from the worst side effects of COVID, from severe disease, hospitalization, and death, while also recognizing, as Dr. Gandhi mentioned, that zero COVID is not an achievable strategy. So when you say, uh, Dr. Rani, moving into a different phase right now, does that mean that this new variant that we're seeing now, uh, BA2, uh, is less lethal but spreads far quicker? So BA2 appears to be equally lethal to BA1, but it is certainly more transmissible than BA1, not to mention more transmissible than Delta and earlier variants of COVID. So what we're seeing is that many more folks will get sick. Of course, as more people get sick, if we don't have adequate protections for them, vaccinations and boosters, we're also going to see more people get hospitalized. It's also tougher to stop because it's more transmissible. So we need this combination of vaccines and boosters and in the midst of a surge, those non-pharmaceutical interventions, things like masks, excellent ventilation and great testing systems to catch people as they get sick rather than waiting until they've already spread it to others. Dr. Kim, you were talking about South Korea a moment ago, but let's look at it in a little more detail. We've seen a massive rise in the number of cases uh, and infections in South Korea, but the country is still going to be easing restrictions on international travel. What is the situation in Seoul, where you are right now? So um, the, the number of infections appeared to peak last week. We actually don't have the, the numbers for today, but Monday and Tuesday were, were lower. And... Um, you know, the, the intensive care units, and, and again, they report this every day, so, so everyone's aware, um, are about 50% capacity, and they actually have additional surge capacity on top of that. So they are they are monitoring uh, the populations that are most at risk. They have uh, hospital capacity to handle uh, additional infections. I think yesterday um, there, there was a reported kind of glitch, and that is that the older people um, who have been uh, okay for seven days are told that they're fine, and so they go off restriction, and then all of a sudden they worsen and go to the hospital. And you know the, the home care system, you know, as soon as you're diagnosed and it confirmed, the government gives you a kit that includes a thermometer, a pulse oximeter, and and, um, and medications, and instructions, and there is a kind of telemedicine type follow up, and it looks like you know not enough people may be getting uh, antivirals uh, or other. Um, agents that will um, help with the help delay the progression or prevent the progression from mild disease to severe disease, and and so as the system of of home care expanded, um, you know there there were some things that that could be fine tuned, and I think this is a part of you know no country has the the playbook, 
uh, for, for this can kind of controlled release. So there's a lot of learning and adjustments uh, that are going to be necessary on the basis of data. If we look at South Korea at the beginning of the outbreak, Dr. Kim, it was one of the big success stories, the way in which the country was able to manage uh, the outbreak and the spread of the virus uh, in South Korea. Uh, what happened this time? Was the country caught off guard? No, I think that um, it, it has to do with the transmission, uh, the characteristics of the Omicron variant. You know, it, it, it is much more transmissible. And so the, the mechanisms that had worked before uh, were not working. The, the healthcare system was being overwhelmed. And at a certain point, I think it might have been 7,000 infections a day, the government understood that it, it actually had, had said, when we reach a certain level, we're not going to be able to continue this. We will push vaccination and boosting. We will set up the home healthcare system. We will start to do the things that are going to be necessary to, you know, do the most important thing which is to keep people alive and to keep the economy open and to allow people to um, to do things. And so this is, you know, this controlled release is a, is a strategy, just like zero COVID is a strategy and wide open is a strategy. Uh, and countries in, in the Asia region, uh, including Singapore, Korea, and, and others, are using high levels of vaccination as a base and then looking at, you know, how do we optimize treatment? How can we not overwhelm the healthcare system? How can we ensure that those who are most at risk of severe disease, hospitalization, and death um, receive the kind of care that they need when they need it? Dr. Monica Gandhi, I mean, we are hearing that, uh, we're hearing on this panel that the key to this is uh, vaccinating people. Uh, both Pfizer and Moderna, the pharmaceutical companies, are seeking authorization for a fourth or second booster shot, that will be a fourth vaccine. And no doubt this is going to lead to more debate on how effective and how long these vaccines last. What do we know about them right now? Um, yes, and I do want to add one point. It is key for vaccination, but therapeutics are also incredibly important, like Dr. Kim said. And really the mainstay now of the new U.S. strategy is both vaccination and having antivirals available for our vulnerable and immunocompromised patients, including monoclonal antibodies to help prevent COVID-19. So to go back to the fourth booster or the fourth shot, really, um, it is not going to be sustainable, actually, to give everyone a fourth booster uh, or a fourth shot or a booster shot every four months. And antibodies last about four months from the booster shot. shot. Um, I wrote a piece just recently in Clinical Infectious Diseases with the help of the editors, which I encourage people, if they could look at, because we formulated a strategy uh, for the fourth booster. It really is that you said waning immunity. That's only really referring to one aspect of the immune system, which is antibodies. And we still have what's called cellular immunity, B cells that produce more antibodies, mm -hmm. and T cells that protect us against severe disease, and aid B cells in making more antibodies if they see the virus in the future. So usually the way we're going to boost, I think, from now on is people who need their antibodies up as high as possible because of other vulnerabilities and they need their antibodies high so that they can confront the virus and immediately fight what's most important, which is severe disease. People who need their antibodies up at all times or are less likely to respond to the first three shots would be people who are immunocompromised. We already have a fourth shot, which yeah. is approved for immunocompromised here, and then older patients. And I don't know what that age is going to be. In the UK, it's over 75. In the US, it's likely to be over 65, which is what Pfizer is asking for. So now, if we look at the situation, Dr. Gandhi, here in uh, the United States, most seniors in this country received their booster shot. That's the third vaccine, uh, let's see, at least six months ago. So will that give them adequate protection against the uh, BA2 virus or variant? Are you asking me? Yes, Sorry. Do, yes, doctor. Um, so what happens is the BA2 variant has three more mutations than BA1, and both of them, um, the antibodies that you get from the vaccine, you had to have really high levels of those antibodies because you had essentially 32 mutations across the spike protein, and so uh, the antibodies didn't work as well. T cells, by the way, worked very well against Omicron. So um, no, probably with time again, after five or six months, the antibodies are going to come down. And people who are older, when the virus is still circulating at high levels, mm -hmm. will need another booster to keep their antibodies high. And so again, I think it's only going to be older people in multiple countries that are going to get that fourth shot. Sweden has already approved 
believe for over 75 as well. Right. Uh, Dr. Megan Rennie, cases are also rising in about a dozen European countries. And if we look at past patterns, the United States normally follows what happens in Europe. Is there reason for deep concern here? You know, those of us in the United States are watching our data closely. There are reasons, as you say, historical, both to suspect that we will follow the pattern in Europe with rising cases and potentially rising hospitalizations, as we've seen in countries like the UK and Netherlands. There are also reasons to think that even if cases rise a little bit in the US, that we may hold off hospitalizations. We have a higher level of disease-induced immunity simply because the prior surges in our country were so much higher because we have a larger percentage of people that were unvaccinated and exposed during the BA1 surge. Uh, we also have access to Paxlovid and Evashield, as well as to Citrovimab. So we have other treatments here in the U.S. So there's a little bit of a wait and see. We're seeing some concerning signs from some early monitoring of, for example, wastewater um, in some areas of the United States. But it's too early to say. We are all watching closely. Of course, we have many things that are similar to Europe in that we've all removed all of our non-vaccine related restrictions at the same time. We've gotten rid of masks. We've gotten rid of vaccine mandates in many workplaces, restaurants, cities, et cetera. This both sets us up for a worse surge and we can hope that potentially in a worst or in a best possible scenario, our failures from the past can help protect us from what's coming in the future. Right. And that was something I was going to ask you about, because talking about restrictions that have already been lifted, uh, New York City just announced it will drop mask mandates for preschool children two to four on April 4th. It's already eliminated uh, masks, the mandate there for older children that was eliminated earlier this month. Um, but are you saying that we still need to uh, abide by those restrictions? So the reality is, is that right now, particularly in New York City, cases are so low that lifting those mask mandates are unlikely to put people at risk. The big question to me is, are our communities willing to put mask mandates or other non-pharmaceutical measures back in place if cases do start to surge again? Once we are on that up curve, before we get to the point of hospital overwhelm, my suspicion, unfortunately, is no. Folks are exhausted from all of the COVID restrictions for the last year. I think it's going to be really tough to put masks back on. That makes me concerned for our kids. We saw record-breaking numbers of hospitalizations of children during the first Omicron surge. It also, again, makes me concerned for the immunosuppressed, especially with continued congressional inaction that's putting in danger our federal funding for treatments and prevention for those who are highest risk in the U.S. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. My thanks to all our guests, Dr. Jerome Kim, Dr. Monica Gandhi, and Dr. Megan Rani for their expertise. With COVID-19 cases on the rise in the United Kingdom, the National Health Service is offering a second vaccine booster to some 5 million people who are considered at high risk for the disease. It includes anyone over 75 years old, nursing home residents, and those who are immunocompromised. Joining us now from Coventry is Professor Lawrence Young. He's a virologist at the University of Warwick. Lawrence Young, thanks so much for joining us. The BA2 has been described as a stealth Omicron variant. What can you tell us about this particular strain and the danger that it poses? Uh, we know it's more transmissible, so it looks like it's at least 30% more contagious than Omicron. And um, it is also, fortunately, uh, able to be protected by current vaccines up to a certain extent. So even though we are seeing the majority of infections that are surging in the UK as due to this BA.2, um, it's, it's starting to result in a, in a small rise in hospitalizations but the levels of protection that we get from current vaccines seem to be holding up. So if a person gets this particular virus, what does it do in terms of illness, in terms of sickness? Yeah, well, a lot of people are getting very um, symptoms that are very similar to common cold type symptoms. So they're not getting severe symptoms. But of course, if you are in that category of vulnerable individuals, who are elderly and whose immune systems aren't as effective, then you can get some severe symptoms. But on the whole, people are experiencing generally mild symptoms. And as I said earlier, the 
vaccination, particularly what's going on in the UK with booster vaccinations, seem to have helped enormously in preventing a large number of people from getting very sick. I was looking at some numbers that have been coming out of the United Kingdom. We're now seeing more than 300,000 cases a day. Uh, this is among the highest levels that we've seen, uh, especially in the 70-plus age group. So how vulnerable are people in that age group? Well, clearly, it's that age group that we're particularly concerned about because we are start starting to see that rise in hospitalizations. And quite a number of individuals who are being hospitalized are in that older age group. That's a consequence of that age group having been booster vaccinated a while ago. So their immunity is decaying. And that's why from this week, we're now rolling out a full booster jab to the over 75s and to more vulnerable people, particularly those in care homes. So it is a case of keeping an eye on what's going on. We know that with such high levels of infection, quite a number of people who are being hospitalized are coming in with COVID rather than because of COVID infection. But that still means that we just need to, to be really careful and keep monitoring what's going on with in relation to the increased spread and transmissibility of BA.2. Now, the British Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, he says there's no particular concern because England is demonstrating to the world a successful model for living with the virus. In fact, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has lifted most of the restrictions uh, in England. What do you make of the government's response? Yeah, well, I'm obviously concerned about it because living with COVID doesn't mean ignoring the virus and hoping it would just go away. That's not the case. It's not only the issue that we've got such high levels of infection. It's what that means for people at work. We've just had reports in the last week that we have over 200,000 school children are off school because of COVID. And of course, we're still grappling with the long term consequences of even mild infections with this virus that can result in, 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 in long term effects, including increased risk of, of heart problems, increased risk of diabetes. So this isn't a trivial, a trivial infection. And the fact that we've completely let our guard down in the UK is a real concern. Now, among the responses uh, from the British government, they say they will stop free mass testing that will stop on April 1st. That's uh, just in about just over a week's time. I mean, how will this affect the spread of the virus? Yeah, we, we just know, we won't know where it is. We, we're even in that position now because we're not doing the same level of testing. People aren't coming forward and, be, and being tested anyway. And with the removal of free testing from the 1st of April, then we won't have any idea where this virus is and where it's going. And, you know, one of the biggest threats with this virus, as we're experiencing with BA.2, is that new variants are going to be thrown up. The more the virus spreads, the more it will generate new variants. And we can't guarantee that those new variants will be uh, any milder than Omicron. They could be far more aggressive and they could also um, work around current vaccines. So I don't think there's any room for complacency. And it's a real worry that with the removal of free testing, we won't know who's infected and people will be going about their business spreading the virus far and wide. Just another question on testing, and uh, this is about the program called REACT. Uh, 150,000 people are randomly tested under this program, um, and that will also stop at the end of this month. Um, how important is that program in detecting how and where the virus is spreading? Yeah, at the moment, we're relying on these types of programs, the REACT program, the ZOE program as well, which is a, is a random assessment of of the spread of infection across across the population, irrespective of whether people are having symptoms or not. So we're going to be, we're going to be completely blind to where this infection is and where it's going. And I think it is a, a really big mistake. And even though we're entering a period of better weather in the UK, where people will be outside more, there'll be more ventilation, I still think we're going to be subject not only to surges and waves of infection, but also to this real concern about the generation of variants from the UK, but also given the removal of travel restrictions and testing of people coming into the country, the possibility that variants will be introduced back into the UK and that will cause more problems. So it's a real concern, actually. Has the government been made aware of these concerns? Yeah, it, it has. It seems to be ignoring it at the moment and giving people this false sense of security. And I think many of us are concerned that letting our guard down now 
given the fact that we have done quite well and the vaccination program has been quite successful. But there are concerns that people will be more complacent and will not come forward for their booster jabs. And we're already seeing that with um, a slight decline in the number of people coming forward for the third jab. Um, and we're worried, many of us are worried that that's what that, that, that this whole impression that the government's giving will mean people are, will be even more complacent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking about those jabs, um, about 67% of the population uh, has had the third booster shot. Are you still finding that there is resistance among the population to this third shot, or indeed to getting vaccinated at all? Yeah, I think there's increasing and growing resistance as a, as, as a general sense of complacency that you know, the virus is no longer a problem and that we are learning to live with it, whatever that means. And I think that's a real concern, actually. You know, we've been very slow in this country to roll out vaccinations to youngsters, um, and it's been sort of approved, but in a rather sort of half-hearted way. So when I, so looking now, for instance, vaccinating the 5 to 12-year-olds, that's now approved, but no, not many parents are coming forward to have their children vaccinated as we'd like. Um, and this is a real concern. It's a concern because we're seeing further disruption to the education of youngsters because of COVID. And even though we can say, well, at this stage, we're seeing mild infections, this can be a very debilitating uh, infection, even in the acute phase. And as I said earlier, it can leave people with long-term consequences. So it is a, the whole thing is a, a bit of a mess at the moment and a real concern that this will add to, to the sense of full security and people will think, well, why bother coming to be vaccinated? We don't need it anymore. One of the measures that the government appears to be really sensitive to is the idea of introducing another lockdown. Uh, would you advise a lockdown at this stage? Oh, no, I don't think so. And I think it's going to be really impossible to put to put the genie back in the bottle, if you like. I think the, the issue of lockdowns are, 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 are long gone in the UK. I can't see any situation, to be frank, where people will be forced to have that type of lockdown. I think what we need to do is, be encu is encourage employers to support their employees when they are infected to, to be able to stay at home. And that's yeah, another big debate here about the, the degree to which employers will support individuals financially if they need to have a few days off. And indeed, how many companies will keep working from home mandates for staff, particularly if they are susceptible um, and vulnerable. And I think all these things are going to cause some problems, particularly as we head into the winter months this year. Lawrence Young, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Minder in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.